Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mayor Kautz, Mayor Lydia. Uh, thank you all for joining us at this early hour for the mayors and, and business leaders' breakfast. It is nice, bright, and early, and we appreciate you all making the uh, effort to, to be here this morning. Uh, I'm Steve Benjamin, the mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, and president of the United States Conference of Mayors. Uh, mayor uh, Carolyn Goodman, our fantastic chair of the Mayor's Business Council from Las Vegas, is unable to, to attend this year's meeting, so in her absence, uh, I'm pleased to preside over today's breakfast. Uh, to get us started, I'd like to thank Wells Fargo, uh, again, a great member of our Business Roundtable and sponsor uh, for sponsoring this breakfast, please. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, my friend, the CEO and Executive Director of the United States Conference of Mayors, Tom Cochran. Tom, fantastic job you guys are doing, pulling this all together. It looks awesome. Uh, Tom Cochran. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, everyone, for being at our Business Council breakfast. Uh, I just wanted to um, make two or three housekeeping announcements. Number one, uh, Mayor Walsh has invited us to join him today in Boston Pride March. It's going to be a big march, but we're going to have our march inside the big march. So um, we will adjourn the day at 1130. And we asked mayors that would want to be with us. Mayor Benjamin and I will see you in the lobby on the first floor. And so we will, you will be directed. It will be an abbreviated march. Uh, it will be 30 minutes. We won't go all the way to City Hall, but we're there to stand united with the community here in Boston and throughout the nation. And so um, I want you to please um, remind you to be back here for our luncheon at 1 o'clock. We have the City Livability Luncheon, the 39th City Livability, City Livability Luncheon. This is our oldest with waste management. So those two things I wanted to mention uh, this morning, and if you could spread the word, word that our march, the mayor's march, will start at 1145 and be in the lo lobby on the first floor to join me and uh, President Benjamin. Today, uh, the Business Council has over, has 139 members. It wasn't too long ago that we started this Business Council, and it has grown to 139 over the years. We find in our surveys of uh, members, members of, that come to this meeting that business contacts, small business and large business, are a big part of why they want to be here. I would like to direct your attention to the screen behind me. First, you'll see a list of the conference's platinum partners. We are grateful to these organizations for providing generous long-term support to the conference of mayors and the mayors of this nation. I would like to also re recognize the, the business council members who have served over 10 years these people have, this, these organizations have stayed and been active with us for a decade. As we, uh, thank you for sticking with us and, and just stay stuck because we're going to keep going with this great president we've got. It's just begun. Then we have a listing of our new members, 17 organizations that have joined our Mayor's Business Council since our January meeting in Washington. So welcome to all the new members of the Business Council. Every organization has to have a steering committee. You know, you can't run anything without a committee. So we got one and we're very proud of it. And we now, I will now display the new uh, Business Council Steering Committee. Congratulations to the new elected Steering Committee members. <laughs> Tyrone Bland, Herbalife, Terry Williams, American Heart Associations, Rick Maya, Postmates, Cynthia Stewart, International Council of Shopping Centers, E. L. Fetter, Zen City, and David Goldwater, Stantec Consultant. We'd also like to congratulate our new chair of our steering committee, Javier Angulo, 
the Senior Director of Community Relations at Walmart. We have today the co-chair of the uh, Business Council, and I'd like to call up uh, our Business Council Steering Committee co-chair, Amy Curry, Curriton of CGI for a few remarks. Amy? Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I'd like to start by welcoming all of the new Business Council members that have joined since January, along with the new Steering Committee members, and I look forward to working with you all so much closer in the year ahead. My fellow co-chair, Kim Pasquale of HDR, I've had the pleasure of serving with her over the last year, and unfortunately she couldn't be with us today, but it's for very good reason. She just welcomed a new addition to her family, a beautiful baby boy. So we are sending well wishes her way. Please know how much she wanted to be here, and of course how much we appreciate her unwavering commitment to this organization. When cities collaborate with businesses, great things happen. This was the fourth year of our best practice report. And mayors, I encourage all of you to read the almost 30 submissions about the great work our business council members do to improve the quality of life in your cities every single day. We're truly partners in building a stronger America together. And I want to personally thank all of the business council members who contribute to the success of this organization every year. And lastly, it's been an absolute pleasure to serve as co-chair especially surrounded by so many incredible women. I would like to give a special thank you to Mayor Goodman for helping the Business Council thrive. And of course, Jerry and Judy for working so tirelessly to help grow the Business Council to 139 members strong. We're so lucky to have you and your support and passion are greatly appreciated. So thank you, mayors, for the work that you do in your cities every day, and please enjoy your breakfast. Thank you, Amy, for your continued service. We look forward uh, to the uh, coming year with your leadership. And um, I wanted to also uh, just amplify a little bit of the best practices report. Uh, 26 business council members have submitted their best of the best this year, and this report will be available at the Conference of Mayors to members to, for the next couple of weeks and will be mailed out to approximately 1,400 mayors throughout the United States. And we want to thank all the uh, 26 members for, that participated in this report. And, and, and a special shout out uh, to uh, the former chairs of the Business Council, and, and to the one and only Doug Palmer, who was a mayor, who was president of this organization, and who, it was his idea, uh, I think with Mr. Pepper from Walmart, to, to uh, have this, uh, Walgreens, to have this report. It's, it's very important, I think, uh, when you look at the lack of funds that we have coming from Washington these days, to show that nothing's gonna stop our cities and nothing's going to stop our business, business of America working for mayors to keep this great nation going. So with that, I'd like to turn it over back to the great president, Mayor Steve Benjamin of Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you, Tom, and, and thank you, Amy, for your leadership on the Business Council Steering Committee. Uh, we look forward to working with uh, Amy and our newly elected co-chair, Javier Angulo of Walmart, and all of you steering committee members in the coming year. Uh, at this time, I want you to join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Wells Fargo's uh, Martin Sunquist. Martin um, has been a regular here, and um, through Wells Fargo, a fantastic supporter of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He's the Senior Vice President of, of Customer and Community Programs and the head of Wells Fargo's Housing Foundation at Wells Fargo Home Lending. Uh, in this role, he oversees national philanthropic initiatives, uh, community outreach, military team member support programs, and the integration of sustainable home ownership programs across home lending, Wells Fargo aff affiliates, and the Wells Fargo Bank. Martin, it's your time, brother.
Thank you, President. Thank you, Mayors. And good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Sunquist, Executive Director of the Wells Fargo Housing Foundation, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today uh, to connect with you and share uh, some of the work that we're doing and hear the great work that you are doing in your communities. Uh, specifically, I want to share with you about our neighborhood lift programs and how they are one of the more effective ways that we are working in communities across the country to help people enter into home ownership. So as I introduce the program to you, let me first talk about the components of the program. First, we provide down payment assistance, and this is a forgivable grant that's made to a consumer to purchase a home. Second, we provide grants locally that help with sustainability and uh, neighborhood revitalization efforts. And third, we provide home buyer education. In fact, home, home ownership counseling is one of the requirements to get a down payment assistance grant. So across America, uh, more than 17,600 17, individuals and families have become homeowners because of this program. And to date, we've been in 59 markets across the country soon to be 60, which I'll talk about in a moment. And some of you in this room, I think, have seen this program in action in your communities. Before I share more about the program, I want to just share a brief video with you. And uh, we'll hear from a family who's been a part of this program. So let's roll the video. Come on, come on. Ever since moving to Arizona, Amanda Nash always lived in apartments. And being a renter, you just definitely don't have that stability. Good girl. And so I really wanted to be a homeowner. I put it on like the list of things to do. It didn't really seem possible. I just thought we were dreaming. Until Amanda learned about Neighborhood Lift. The program was created by Wells Fargo and NeighborWorks America, a nonprofit dedicated to stabilizing communities. Lift programs have created homeowners across the U.S. NeighborWorks America works with local nonprofits like Trellis in Phoenix on home buyer education and other services. Wells Fargo offers matching down payment assistance grants. Well, the reactions that we receive for customers that receive the down payment assistance grant is truly excitement. Amanda enrolled in a class, then applied for down payment assistance. Amanda Nash is just one of the great stories where homeowners come to our education class and really understand the process. They can let go of that fear of not knowing what they're doing. It made me think like, this is actually possible and I can do it. One of the conditions with the Lyft grant was that we had to live here for five years. And I was like, yes, I can't wait to live someplace for five years. Hi, Miss Nadia. Having that grant just really helped put us in a position where we could buy a home in a better neighborhood that was still affordable. <laughs> the benefit that we have of buying the house using the lift is our mortgage is definitely less than what we were paying in rent previously. All right, your turn, go. And I just love that it's a place where people can come and feel welcome and like they're a part of our home too because it's really all about family. <laughs> A blended family that includes grandchildren and foreign exchange students. Having a home and having the extra bedroom was more than just having a family for me. It was also about creating opportunities for other people. Seeing my family together, having good times in my home is it's priceless. All right, well, watching, thank you. Watching this family story and hearing uh, the outcome and how Lyft has helped that family is just a wonderful thing. And I'm proud to be a part of that and, and to see them feel empowered and, and enjoying their new home and knowing that thousands of other families and individuals across the country are experiencing the same thing because of the program. We're six years in on this program and we're, we're reaching nearly $400 million in our uh, commitment to the program with over 35,000 potential home buyers attending our launch events. Uh, we recently launched in Atlanta. Anyone from Atlanta in the room? All right, there's Atlanta. Uh, we recently launched in Atlanta, and, and in Atlanta, customers received $15,000 in down payment assistance. This is a forgivable grant, so if you stay in the home for five years, you earn that for full value. And what I'm really happy to share with you is we've added a new component to the program. And that is if you are a first responder, if you are a teacher, if you are active or retired military, you get an additional $2,500 of down payment assistance. So those that give to your city can live in your city. 
So I'm pleased to share that in 20 short days, we'll be right here in Boston in our 60th launch in six years. And uh, that's scheduled for June 29th and 30th. So we're gonna be happy to be back here bringing the great program to Boston. Uh, it makes me happy to see families happy. And, and with that, I'll leave it at that. And I wanna thank you for the honor of being with you this morning. And I wish you the best conference. Thank you. Martin, thank Wells Fargo. Um, for the final segment of our breakfast, I'd like to turn the program over uh, to my colleague and friend, South Bend Mayor Poot Buttigieg, uh, who's going to moderate our panel on workforce training in the age of automation. Um, as we bring Mayor Pete uh, and the panelists on stage, I'd like to thank the panel's sponsors, uh, McDonald's Corporation, uh, and we'd like to also acknowledge our U.S. Conference of Mayors Workforce Development Council Board President Judy McDonald. Uh, Executive Director of, of Workforce Solutions for Tarrant County. Uh, and Judy, please, please. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, thank the WDC uh, for its support of our panel uh, this morning. So, Mayor Pete, stage is yours, man. Well, good morning. There is any doubt that uh, mayors are the level of government where the most energy and problem solving happens. Let it be settled by the number of people willing to be discussing these issues at this hour on a beautiful Saturday. Uh, my name is Pete Buttigieg. I have the privilege of serving as mayor of South Bend, Indiana, uh, and also as chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Automation Task Force. And we've been looking forward to this morning's plenary panel discussion on workforce training in the age of automation. I want to begin by pointing out this is going to be an interactive session, so this is one case when it will not hurt my feelings if you are paying attention to your screen. Uh, we are working with Slido.com, and uh, if you haven't already logged in, we invite you to do so now. Um, the website is linked if you're on the USCM app uh, for this convening, or you can just go to a browser and key in Slido.com. I think SLI.do will also do the trick. There's a code, you can see the hashtag on the screen somewhere, uh, that's USCM2018. And when you key in that code as you go to slido.com, it's going to kick you to a page that we'll be using to begin answering and asking survey questions um, through this website on your devices as we go. And you'll see instructions on your tables as well as on screen. So let's get underway. Uh, we're going to be examining today the future of work in a rapidly changing economy as innovation, automation, and artificial intelligence fundamentally alter the ways in which Americans work. This is a kind of technology that has very quickly moved from the stuff of science fiction to our everyday lived experience. We're using it in medicine to read x-rays and MRIs and in the financial sector for stock trading. Soon AI will be found touching every industry and in some way, directly or indirectly, every job around the world. And as we're already surrounded by smart machines running on incredibly powerful self-learning software programs, we notice that technologies that didn't even exist 10 years ago are now taken for granted. So this brings me to our first question. Hopefully you've been able to queue up uh, Slido on your device. Uh, and it is this, we'll give, we'll give folks a minute to respond. Which of the following technologies are most transformative? Ride sharing, digital assistance, or self-service kiosks? And I'm just gonna go ahead and vote and invite you to do the same. Later on, we'll be having a discussion about voter turnout. <laughs> so hopefully this will establish a good precedent. That's pretty good. Can we break the 100? There we go, all right. Looks like a pretty clear winner. Not a surprising one for those of us who are involved in regulating how people move around and helping to improve it. All right. With any technological transformation, this affects the future of work. Workers are facing uncertainty, insecurity, transformation about where they fit at a time when my generation is likely to change careers more often than my parents' generation changed jobs. 
But unlike some of the previous shocks that we've experienced economically, we know that this is a shift that we can very much see coming. And so we are responsible for how we can prepare for it. Our next question on Slido as we go to question number two is this. What share of people do you expect to be at risk in terms of their jobs because of technologies that are currently available? As you think about some of those technologies emerging around us, and if you were to hazard a guess, there's, uh, there's actually a, an emerging consensus, but before the big reveal, let's see what our attendees think. Look at that turnout, already into triple digits, all right. Consensus around 35, I'll give it another minute or two. I had an encounter with an automated uh, Mater D recently in Los Angeles airport, and it got me wondering how long before somebody develops an automated mayor. Hopefully that's a little further off. Um, looks like uh, the consensus of the room is forming around 35%. If you do a, a scan of the literature around this and the reports that have emerged in, in recent years, uh, the number's actually converging around 50% or higher. As leaders of our nation's cities, we have to prepare our residents for this coming change. We cannot offer false promises about turning back the clock. And as some jobs are fading out of the marketplace, we have a responsibility to prepare our workers to navigate what comes next. Those who succeed in the phase to come will not necessarily be those who have to create new machines, but those who can figure out what to do with them. And by installing a, instilling a culture of lifelong learning and training opportunities in our cities, we can make sure that in an age of intelligent machines, our residents can continue to find their place. But if we don't deliver, many will struggle, especially our most vulnerable residents with lower levels of income, education, or skills. Which brings us to our next question. How many people in this room, and how concerned are you, I should say, about the ability of low-wage and low-income workers to support their families being impacted by artificial intelligence and automation? Cue up the next question. There we go. All right. Yep. I look forward to meeting the 2% of optimists in this room who are <laughs> not concerned. <laughs> Pretty clear answer among this group. All right, well, those 2%, feel free to go fetch a cup of coffee. <laughs> the rest of us uh, are in for a treat, because if you believe that in any way these trends are something that require our attention, they require innovation, they require creativity on the part of America's mayors and cities, then you're going to benefit a great deal from the speakers who are uh, on their way out. Um, let me invite all of our panelists to come on out and take a seat, and then I will um, introduce each of them in turn. Our first presenter is Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin. Mayor Durkin is the 56th mayor of Seattle and is the first woman to lead the city in nearly a century. One of the cornerstones of her administration has been ensuring that Seattle's young people are prepared for the jobs of the future through her family's education, preschool, and promise plan. She is working to close the opportunity gap in her city to make sure all of her residents have pathways to good paying jobs and real economic opportunity. Uh, shockingly, the remarks that were prepared for me do not mention the most important fact on her resume, which is that she is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, just one of many reasons that we are lucky to hear her voice this morning. Mayor Durkin. Thank you very much, and I'm going very old school on my notes. Um, thank you for being here. So glad to see so many people uh, this early in the morning thinking about the future. And I will say that South Bend, when I went to college, did not have a mayor like this mayor, so wish we had. Uh, I think that in the age of automation, we have to be looking at a variety of factors. And I think the truth is, 
that the national government and even states governments are not dealing with the issue, and they will hit our cities first. Many of us are already seeing uh, the results of continuing automation and the changing economy. In Seattle, we have an amazing economy right now, but the economy that is rising is what I call the new innovation economy. And the old economy is, being, is not as uh, rising as quickly, and that gap is causing great inequities. And as we continue to innovate and that technology increases, I think we will see a period of time in history that is more displacing than the Industrial Revolution and that we as mayors are going to have the obligation, the need, to make sure that we innovate as quickly and that we protect our families, our workforces, and our jobs. Workforce training doesn't just mean skills and retraining. That was a very 90s approach. How do we, quote, retrain people as the economy shifts? We have to be looking at not only what are those job skill sets, but what is the creativity that's needed from workplace to workplace. More and more, particularly in millennial generations, people stay in a workplace only about two to three years. Two to three years. Um, in our generation, the generation before me, people would stay a lifetime. So as people move laterally from business to business, they have to bring with them skill sets. We also know they have to bring with them benefits because as we are increasingly going to what's called the gig economy, and people move and, and have, don't have the benefits of the last uh, economy, we will see displacement in all of our cities because they will come to the end of their careers or in between jobs, and many of them will need the services that we know fall upon our cities. We can't afford to forget also the importance of creative training, which I'm going to be talking about in just a minute. If we are talking about the impacts of automation, Innovation's fantastic. It's amazing what you can do from your phone today. We were just talking that when I, uh, in my previous job, I had an office in DC and an apartment in DC. I would get on the plane in Seattle and right before I would take off, I'd order my groceries for two days. And they'd be there when I arrived. When my plane would touch down in DC, I'd order my dinner. And it would be there when I arrived. And I could do it all from my phone. That is an amazing development in technology, but with it comes a changing workforce. We've seen the, the, the data that, that our mayor from South Bend talked about, but if you look at what's going into the future, just from the automation of automobiles, automobiles and drivers, it's estimated that sometime in the next five to seven years, as many as 20 million people could be out of work your delivery truck drivers, your, your car drivers. We were saying, you know, if my children who are teenagers and, and 21, if they have the choice between, you know, walking five blocks in the rain or calling their pod up on their car, on their phone, they're gonna call that automated pod. And so we have to be thinking as we innovate, how do we make sure that those unintended consequences that we have real policy discussions around and we pre prepare for economically? I think the number one way to accomplish that is to be focusing, as mayors, on economic opportunity, real economic opportunity. We have to be able to have our workforces in our cities prepared for that future. Um, take a, a factor from Seattle. We are expecting that in the Puget Sound Basin and Seattle area, that there will be about 700,000 jobs created in the next five years. 700,000 jobs. Almost, the, well, the vast majority of them require post-high school education. Yet in that region, only 30% of our kids are getting it. So we have these jobs coming in our line in a mismatch with our educational system. It's one reason that one of my signature initiatives is to try to get two years free college for every Seattle high school graduate. It will change the economy of our city to have that gap between the new economy and the old economy and really lift up, particularly in communities of color. The other thing I would urge mayors when you're looking at this, as we bring on new technology, in particularly in Seattle, we're looking at electrifying our fleets and our cars. We have to make sure that we are not further making a, de a divide between communities of color, poor communities, and other communities. 
because some of this technology is not just not reachable for communities. So for example, the electrification of our grid, which we're trying to do in Seattle. There's many parts of our city where people don't have access to chargers, would never have access to chargers, unless we in the city decide that we're gonna make that part of our policy and work with companies in the economy to do that. So the Seattle Promise free tuition is gonna be a key thing to drive the economy in our city. Another thing we have is we have many working adults that have dropped out of the economy or become underemployed. We've put together a center to try to retrain people, give them access to other skills and other jobs. We also have a creative advantage initiative. We can't build cities of the future that don't have a really vibrant, creative, artistic um, heart and soul. And so in Seattle, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we include the arts in, in all of our education? How do we have great public squares? And to do this in our K-5, we've doubled, for example, through our Families in Education levy, the number of music and visual arts available in K-12 through to make sure that those classes that get cut first in the education system, music and those types of electives, that we increase the ability to have that creative thought. I really believe that that's going to put us in the future, the ability to have those kids coming up, to have the education and the work skills to go across any kind of business in the future. And it shows that it works. If you look at the, what companies want in the new technology environment, they are looking for very creative thinkers. You know, we are seeing that computer scientists and software engineers, more of them are coming out, so employers are looking at what are those other skill bases they have. So I think if you're looking in your city to start pilots and programs, that's something you can start right away in terms of making sure your schools are innovative but increase that artistic um, education. We're also thinking about how do we op optimize ourselves as a city, as an employer. And so you can look across your city and your enterprise and think about how are you using technology and innovation? How are you making sure that your workplace is one that's really equity driven? Are you making sure that people of color and women are having an equal opportunity in your workforce? And are you constantly innovating to be not just more efficient, but to deliver better services for your city? It is difficult, I'm sure everyone is like Seattle, where the budgets that the government has pale in comparison to private industry and the ability to innovate. Uh, sometimes they joke in my office that the best way to get the uh, computer systems working better is to feed the squirrels that keep them running. Uh, but we can all do better, and if we look down the road at what that new economy is going to look like, cities have to lead. We have to be the ones that are driving it because we are the ones that deal with the consequences when it doesn't work. If you look at every city today and the challenges we face, in one way or another, it's because we're trying to catch up on something, either in our workforce or our infrastructure or our inclusion. Um, that's why these three eyes for this conference. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker, do you introduce him or do I? I'm going to try my luck with stage geometry. Oh, they got that done. All right, look at that. Save us coming and going. Thank you, Mayor Durkin, uh, for your leadership and for your remarks. Our next panelist is the Chief Communications Officer and Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations for McDonald's Corporation, Robert Gibbs. Robert leads McDonald's corporate relations teams, including corporate communications, government relations, and external communications. And if he looks highly familiar to you, but you can't quite place him, just substitute in your mind that Lucite podium uh, for that of the White House briefing room, and you'll remember uh, his days informing America as press secretary for President Obama during his first two terms, uh, where he served not only as the voice of the administration, but uh, as a valued advisor to the president on policy and political matters critical to the administration. We've been looking forward to hearing from him. Please welcome Robert Gibbs. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin, for this opportunity. Mayor Pete, for your leadership in, in this group uh, and in your community. Uh, and to Mayor Durkin, I was telling her this time last week, my family was in the beautiful city of Seattle enjoying 
uh, the blue skies and sun and walking around in, in a, just a spectacular city. So thank you. As we're talking about here today, few issues are more important today and to our country and to our cities than ensuring that we are developing the next generation of workers. Giving people tools, training, and mentorship are needed to succeed in a dramatically changing global economy and a workplace like never before. We're acutely aware of this challenge at McDonald's. More than 37,000 restaurants in 120 different markets takes good people, a lot of good people, to run great restaurants and to provide great experiences to our customers each and every day. Every year in the U.S. alone, our company and our independent franchisees hire nearly 600,000 young adults. Over 100,000 of those young men and women come from communities with double the national poverty rate. While all have that tremendous potential, many have been disconnected from the opportunities they need to develop their talent. The challenge isn't just that we need so many workers. At McDonald's and nearly every successful business today, the need is growing for highly talented and highly engaged workers, closing that education gap that Mayor Durkin talked about. Our business has been undergoing a massive transformation. That's what is required to satisfy the rising expectations of consumers in a fiercely competitive industry. We're creating a blend of high-tech and high-touch experiences for customers, including new online ordering, pickup, and delivery services, new customized menu options, new touchscreen ordering kiosks, and restaurant experiences offering much greater hospitality, convenience, and choice. As we continue to introduce innovations in our restaurants, changes require more from McDonald's crew to come from out from behind the counter into the front of the restaurants to interact directly with customers, provide greater levels of hospitality, and in managing increasingly sophisticated technology. Success depends on our significant and ongoing commitment to training, education, and development programs. We launched a program in 2015 that we call Archways to Opportunity, and it has been a critical enabler in our workforce development. It was designed to help our restaurant employees grow no matter where they are on their educational journey. Over the past three years, Archways provided more than 24,000 of our restaurant employees with opportunities to earn a high school diploma, receive upfront college tuition assistance, access free educational advising services, and learn English as a second language. In that time, we've given over $21 million has been awarded so far for high school and college tuition assistance. We were happy in April to announce a dramatic expansion and commitment to the next step in that program. We are nearly tripling the amount of money that a McDonald's crew member can receive to advance their education and development. And by dedicating $150 million over the next five years to this program and lowering dramatically the work length requirement to qualify. In just three months of employment at a McDonald's, just a summer job, crew are eligible for $2,500 in tuition assistance. This will provide nearly 400,000 U.S. restaurant employees at McDonald's with access to this important program as we lower those eligibility requirements. I could go on and on about the enthusiasm and the energy that's felt in the restaurants and with the owner operators around this. Um, but I will show a short film, I promise it's short, uh, to let the film do the talking. Let's take a look. Dear Sebastian, after careful consideration of your application, it is with great pleasure that we offer our congratulations on your acceptance. In the beginning, it was just me and my mom, and she used to work two jobs. She used to make sure um, I went to school. I had a lot of problems in, at home, you know, I, I knew people were looking at me like, you're a high school dropout and you sleep in your car. So that was really hard. I was born in Mexico. I came over here when I was eight years old.
McDonald's, it teaches you a lot of people skills. Overall, it just helps you grow as a person. After you go through all the training, they teach you the skills that you need to learn. You become very proficient. You know, when I finally graduated, I was like, now I can go to college. I just dream of a bigger future for myself. All of that did start with the online high school diploma. It's crazy. When I walked across the stage and I grabbed my degree, it was super emotional because, look, I'm here thanks to McDonald's. You know, I came from nothing, you know, and to now being a GM and, you know, having my college degree. I was given all that help, and, you know, sometimes people, that's all they need. I feel really hopeful about my future. I feel like I can really achieve anything. Thank you. We are tremendously excited about this important program, and, and those, are, those stories are real. We've, um, we have six students graduating from college this morning in Colorado. Uh, so it's making a real difference in the lives of people. We're excited, too, since announcing the expansion uh, of this program, that we've partnered with nearly 20 mayors and their workforce development programs across the country from Newark to Indianapolis to Los Angeles to encourage, uh, and we encourage all of you to partner with us to spread the word and get your residents employed and on the road to their educational dreams. Our next, uh, our next step is to build on the success of Archways and turn our attention to pre-employment services. You can't be what you can't see. How do we support youth living in disconnected communities who don't have access to core job training skills to help them land their first or second job and keep it? By bringing restaurant employees more opportunities to further their education and pursue their career aspirations, we're helping them find their full potential, whether it is at McDonald's or elsewhere in their lives. We see firsthand how life-changing it can be, as you saw in that video. When young people are given the right tools, and education and support to pursue their ambitions. We're excited to continue to build on the success of Arch Waste Opportunity by providing those tools, that training, that advancement to our restaurant employees and communities throughout the country in order to prepare them for the hopes and opportunities and challenges of the economy of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that presentation. Our third panelist is Vikram Iyer, my friend and a vice president of global public policy for the on-demand technology platform Postmates. As Postmates is creating new opportunities for brick and mortar businesses in the era of e-commerce, is also influencing the way independent workers and automated robotics are shaping the labor market. Iyer helps lead the legislative, regulatory, and policy discussions at federal, state, and municipal levels that are impacting the future of work and the on-demand industry. He's here to tell us more about Postmates, and we hope to spark more dialogue among the mayors here in this room. Vikram, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having uh, us today and to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, particularly the Business Council. It's a real incredible forum to convene so many thoughtful mayors from across the country and really get a chance to kickstart public-private uh, dialogues, which I know might sound, that P3 concept might sound obvious to many of those in the room. I know it was discussed on stage. But for a younger tech company, that's a very big deal for us to actually start leaning into these conversations through forums like this. So, so thank you so much. And before I sort of lean into this, I do want to say really appreciate uh, Mayor Pete's leadership, specifically on, on the automation workforce. Um, been very moved by, by his thinking around this. Mayor Durgan, we know that the city of Seattle is constantly um, tackling sort of at the state of the art of policymaking housing challenges, transportation challenges. So it's just an honor to be on stage with you today. Um, and Mr. Gibbs, that was an incredible workforce investment announcement and it's also an honor to be on stage with someone who actually could stand at a podium longer than uh, an hour at a time um, and deal with the press, so appreciate that. Um, 
I want to start by a very simple notion that I know is very obvious to all the mayors in the room, and that's that commerce is fundamentally changing in cities. Um, for Postmates, we are an actual an app-based platform that is a three-sided marketplace. We connect you, the customer, to a merchant in your community, to a courier network of about 150,000 to 200 couriers that can deliver items on demand and at any given time right to your doorstep. So for senior citizens, for example, with mobility issues, this actually means health and wellness products can be delivered to your house so you can still access goods from your local store but maintain that sense of dignity. If you're a younger college student, for example, and you seem to be hung over on a Sunday morning, it also means that you can get food delivered from your uh, local merchants. But when we say that this is actually on-demand uh, delivery of anything, anytime, anywhere, what we really mean is not just the convenience economy. And when we talk about workforce development, I think it's very easy to focus on skills and labor. And that's an important place to maintain focus. But I want to zoom out for a little bit and focus on an entire sector that's facing incredible global headwinds, and that's retail. Right now, when you think of most retail opportunities in your cities that are fueled by the e-commerce platforms that Mayor Durgan spoke about in terms of convenience, we think of the Amazon.coms, the Walmart.coms, incredible businesses that have created incredible, revved incredible engines of economic opportunity in our towns. But if you think of it, they're actually building warehouses on the outskirts of cities and then funneling goods into town. It's convenient, we've all used it, but it really overlooks the local retailers. Brick and mortar in each of your communities has faced incredible challenges in the past couple of years. And one of the most startling statistics coming out of this administration's Labor Department was in January. Right on the heels of the holiday shopping season in December, even though employment numbers were revving up strongly in a positive direction, retail numbers were plummeted. Mayors know this all too well. So what we at Postmates actually do is instead of building that city to warehouse outside of a city, we treat the entire city as a warehouse. We index the product offerings of businesses and what's sold within those businesses, and then we connect them to a warehouse-like distribution platform. That's a matching algorithm that allows them to access new customers. That's a mapping algorithm that allows them to extend the reach of their sales far beyond just anyone locally in their neighborhood. And it's that vast courier network of 150 to 200,000 couriers delivering in real time. That has really, really material economic impacts for a brick and mortar retailer, a corner store, bodega, even the local hardware store. Because now all of a sudden, instead of getting your light bulbs or plungers or any other household essential items, from a major e-commerce platform, you can actually buy it in your community. And that brick and mortar retail story is what's fueling our vision of what workforce development ought to look like when we talk about the future of work and the on-demand economy. I wanna actually dig into where from a policy perspective we see the biggest elements of ability to work with mayors, but I wanna just animate a quick story, and that is that even though our customer base seems to be a more millennial, a more lazy, more convenience-driven economy, when you think about the notion of uh, 18 to 34 year olds purchasing at a high rate. We've also seen an incredible distribution for those that are on the, that are growing with the 54 and above demographic, which actually indicates this notion of younger families and older families starting to realize that time is purchasing power and being able to connect to those communities is quite incredible. So if you can actually retrieve uh, Chick-fil-A on demand, mattresses on demand, even moisturizer and lotion on demand. That might mean that the EPA administrators are target demographic customer too, but it actually means that there's a way in which commerce is moving in cities in this very, very incredible way. And that has actually created massive economic activity for us. In the last year, $1.2 billion worth of goods in 2017 alone were sold by local businesses in 300 U.S. cities. That actually resulted in a 3.7 times increase in sales for those brick and mortar merchants as compared to those that didn't use on-demand delivery. And that created a follow-on economic impact of about 6.6 .6 billion in that economy. And that's really important because this isn't just about our company Postmates, this is about a lot of on-demand economy partners that are out there. 
For every dollar that's spent ostensibly through that app, that has a ripple effect that allows, at least for our company, about $18 more in additional spend. Because now, all of a sudden, storefronts are processing more order volume. What was typically just confined to the square footage of a dining room for a restaurant, now their customer base extends far beyond that. Customers on the other side of town are now requiring them to hire more to just maintain that order volume, which means increases in jobs, increases in storefronts, and that follow-on expanded tax base, tax base sorry, ripples throughout the economy. Now, if you take a look at this at a city-by-city -city level, we're particularly proud of what this has meant. For even a city like Seattle, we've been able to see a three times increase in sales for, for on-demand partners. In Los Angeles, a 10x increase. In Phoenix, an 8x increase. And as we continue to lean into this on-demand economy, we're actually really proud to not only ensure that the couriers that are delivering on our platform are making 153% um, more than federal minimum wage, but we're also proud that last year alone they earned over $216 million. Um, and this is really, really important to us because if we found that a 3.7x increase in sales for brick and mortar retail can help rev the engines of those local economies, today we're proud to announce that we're starting to expand our reach beyond those 300 cities. We're going to Mayor Benjamin, who kicked off, kicked us off this morning. We're going to Columbia, South Carolina. Soon we'll be trying to map out our space in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in Baton Rouge, in Anchorage, and. What we need from mayors is actually an understanding of where are those isolated businesses in your community? Are there those small businesses and merchants who maybe maybe an older generation and don't know how to get on a platform like ours in the same way that they may not know how to register a business on Yelp or Google Ads? This is a really, really key component for any young tech company, so that way we can understand are there dis geographically dislocated regions in your community or food deserts that we can plug our app and our courier network in to figure out a way to actually service those goods and bring more merchant delivery to your communities. And if any of you guys are interested in having us expand in your cities, I would love to talk to you about that. Now, specifically, when it comes to automation and our challenges today, we've actually been testing a recent experiment. As I mentioned to you earlier, um, our Postmates, on average, are earning about $18 per hour. It's, you know, not the most glamorous wage, but certainly better than minimum wage in most cities. But right now, if we wanted coffee delivered from across the street, a Postmate courier would bring that to us in this hotel. But if it's across the street, they're not making much money off of that. That $18 per hour that I mentioned, that's contingent on runs that are about, on average, a mile and above. So we said, OK, for that truly last mile, less than a mile gap, how can we make sure that that merchant across the street is not shortchanged and not unable to sell just because the Postmate courier doesn't want to make that delivery, but at the same time, how do we make sure that that Postmate courier can make more money, that we're reserving them for the meaningful work on the, on the platform that allows them to earn? So we started testing these robotic deliveries in multiple markets. We started out in Washington, D.C., and instead of deploying the robotics and asking for forgiveness later, we've actually been working with local governments. Mayor Bowser in DC helped us craft a memorandum and framework of deployment in that town. We then worked with the governor of Virginia. We've worked with the mayor of Austin. We're, we were worked with a smattering of cities in, in California. And what this has allowed us to do is actually integrate robotics into our supply chain. And we've learned three things. One, we've actually had zero job loss. And all of the couriers that were maintained on the platform have actually been able to earn more money as a result of this. Two, for every one of these robotic devices that we deploy to a sidewalk, we've actually been able to take around 1.7 cars off the road. Now, we're not going to say that these little guys on the street are going to solve for congestion in your communities. But if you start to think about automation and on-demand delivery as unique ways to experiment with how you solve for not just accessing food, how you solve for creating more brick and mortar growth, or how you solve for congestion patterns, all of a sudden that P3 concept of a public-private partnership means light years beyond what it means to just be a tech company that wants to work in its own R&D labs versus government that seemingly needs to be at odds with tech. Together, we can really create meaningful engagements together. And the third thing that we learned is that merchants and the customers were actually able to interact with these devices in a meaningful way, and it didn't throw off pedestrians that were walking up and down. And I think that when it comes to robotics, it's really important for us to test those qualitative elements. 
Now, of course, I wanted to level set with this story of what on-demand technology looks like in your communities, not as a commercial for Postmates, but to let you know what the economic gains can be. At the end of the day, though, we realize that this is bleeding right into an automation impacting the workforce debate. Whether we think our numbers show that there's no job loss or not, we are at the forefront of the fact that automated devices of delivery modes and logistics are transforming the face of retail in our communities. Layer on top of that, those 150,000 couriers or Postmates that I mentioned, they're independent contractors, much in the same way Lyft drivers and Uber drivers are, which means that we have to solve for a safety net that's evolving with outdated employment laws by maintaining a pace of more disaggregated and independent work. That's why we're really proud with the city of San Francisco that we were able to work with the, the honorable mayor, former mayor Ed Lee, on a gig economy toolkit that it started routing independent contractors to healthcare services in that city, employment services in that city, business licensure requirement obligations in that city. We've also been working with a handful of upskilling organizations like the Guild and JBS to actually, as Robert said, figure out how do you actually expand their opportunity beyond just being on the platform. As much as I love my Postmates delivering me burritos on that lazy Sunday, we want to make sure that they're not Postmates for life. We want to make sure that they're actually able to see upward mobility. So we've been trying to, with a strong appetite, work with mayors to figure out what are some educational programmings that we can amplify through our application when we have about 10 million users logging into our app every day. We have a captive digital set of eyeballs that are tuned into that application. So how can we promote programs that are going on in your city? We've also been able to work with the city of LA and the city of San Francisco on apprenticeship programs where we onboard individuals that maybe don't have a fancy computer science degree from Stanford or Harvard, but are actually able to be brought on board at a tech company like ours and learn skills on sites. And we've actually worked with veterans organizations like Swords to Plowshares because un unbeknownst to us, Navy vets and Air Force vets are incredible at operating fleets of robotics. And since that's a new uh, working product class for us, that's a new job class that we're able to hire. At the end of the day, though, when it comes to how we actually explore all of these new workforce issues, what we really need at our backs is data. Earlier this week, the Trump administration released through the Bureau of Labor Statistics the first snapshot of how many workers in America were working in contingent worker arrangements or alternative worker arrangements, basically independent contractors, temporary jobs. Unfortunately, that data, which hadn't been updated since 2005, missed capturing information that was one of the most momentous historic moments since 2005, the introduction of the iPhone. That BLS, that Bureau of Labor Statistics data set, didn't actually ask the question or release the question, how many of you are finding work by using online platforms? What we really need moving forward when it comes to policy making in the gig economy, how do you create benefits for individuals, how do you invest in their upward mobility, is a very clear, granular snapshot of what this data looks like in America. And that's important because as Mayor Durgan talked about, we need to be as a company talking about portable benefits, how individuals who are independent contractors disaggregated from the workforce are able to access benefits. To Mayor uh, Tubbs's credit in Stockton, whether you agree with it or not, mayors are huge, 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 uh, cities, sorry, are huge petri dishes of policy experimentation. So running UBI experiments like he has in Stockton, California, or running portable benefits experiments in other places are areas Areas where tech companies are very interested in working with you. Because at the end of the day, we would argue at Postmates that bipartisanship when it comes to dealing with the future of work is not just about blue collar or white collar, it's not just about Republican or Democrat, it's actually about labor and industry working together. Because in a massive way, the company that we create for all of the economic gains that we've had in your communities, we recognize this is causing threats to traditional forms of work. There are debates about what the future of work looks like because there's a misunderstanding of what the dignity of work will mean tomorrow based off of what we know the dignity of work has meant today. That means that labor and tech have to work together, we have to work with mayors, and we have to make sure that for any of these issues that are policy fixes for the future of work are based off of a rigorous multi-stakeholder process. And I commit to you as a tech company that's interested in this space that to the extent that mayors are willing to work with us and are open to these conversations, we are very, very game to play ball. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, that raises so many interesting and profound questions, and, and we've uh, just got a, a few minutes to explore them. But I, I did want to invite each panelist to share a little bit uh, about how you think about timing. So uh, I know from a city of South Bend perspective, there are some decisions that we'll be making differently by the end of this year because of automation. Gear, for example, that, that we buy. We've got trash trucks now where the a robotic arm saves us having a picker in a injury-prone job to, to deliver that. Uh, other decisions that uh, are 50-year decisions about where a train station ought to go, where the right answer might become different because of a technology that uh, really hits the ground in 10 years or 20 years. So uh, since we have this opportunity, we've got uh, uh, a fast-growing technology company, uh, one of the most recognizable and established uh, American uh, global companies, uh, and uh, a city that, that's known for looking to the future but has a very rich history. Uh, I'd love to know, maybe starting with you, Mayor Durkin, um, how you think we, we might start to arrange our sort of short-term versus long-term thinking and what mayors and those who work with cities ought to think about when it comes to what needs to change today and what do we need to have in the back of our minds as we prepare uh, long beyond our terms are over? You know, I think it's a combination. I think you have to have the short-term immediate answers you have today. You also have to be thinking about what does that look like in 5, 10, and 15 years? I think the thing we put up on the screen was if you, you know, imagine yourself on a rainy Seattle day and you can either walk the 10 blocks to the sound transit station or you can hit an app on your phone and a pod, a little autonomous pod, just come get you, which would you do? Um, because we're spending literally billions of dollars to site light rail in Seattle, mm -hmm. fixed lines, stations, and are we going to be agile enough for the future? So we have to not only solve the problems of today, how do we do garbage pickup, but as we build this infrastructure, are we really building for that city of tomorrow? Or are we spending so much money that by the time we're done, it's obsolete in five or 10 years? Um, and then we look at AI. You know, will AI take over some decisions in government itself? Um, as mayor, I would have liked to said, you know, Watson, what should we do about the head tax? <laughs> um, I didn't say Alexa. Uh, I knew that answer. Um, but I really believe that we've got to be looking at that future and looking at the small workplaces and the big workplaces to see what are those immediate things we can do to be more efficient, but what's going to be the impact down the road? Yeah. I agree with everything the mayor said. I think one of the things that, that we have to tackle in, the, in this space is as that, you almost have parallel time tracks here because you've got what is happening with technology and how that's gonna change work and understanding that it will take time to change that workforce, right? So you think about the, the, there will be different sort of pain points, if you will, on education and training for somebody that is either, you certainly have post high school or out of high school, that little older age, but then you've got somebody who's just about to come out of high school, and then you've got you know, three and five-year-olds that are going into pre-K or kindergarten. And the real, the real push that, and, and I think the imagination that we have to bring to this discussion and debate is understanding, again, that we may be moving, that some things are just immovable in time, even as you have this, again, this rapid parallel technology shift that will put different, and I think we've, we've just got to you know, engage partners, businesses, uh, policymakers all together to try to figure out how to, quite frankly, surround these problems and figure out new and innovative ways to, to come up with answers. It feels almost like there's a paradox here where the future state looks beautiful and all of us can sit back and the burrito comes to us and uh, uh, there's not that much you have Seattle. to do about it. <laughs> You're already there. Yeah. Um, but, but that transition from here to there is one where it creates a lot of responsibilities for us, uh, whether it's in, in policy or in the corporate space. How, at the outset, Vikram, of a, a really, in, in some ways, a whole new industry forming uh, around you, how, how do you view that question? I think we have a lot of insight about the state of the art of technology. And one thing that Germany, for example, does brilliantly is make sure that manufacturing sectors that are at the cutting edge of advanced manufacturing work pretty closely in cahoots with 
um, institutions of higher learning. So that way students can back into the skills required for those jobs as soon as they graduate. I think the onus is on us on the industry side to really try and invest in that workforce development, to try and extrapolate curricula that could be applied to things like algorithms, things like robotics, and then do our best to share them with cities, public school districts, institutions of higher learning, so that way we can work to invest in that workforce. Makes sense. Along the way. Well, uh, time flies when you are discussing the future, so uh, we are uh, nearly at our close already, uh, but hopefully this has created food for thought. Uh, as we go into our other sessions, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we'll be having a dedicated discussion about automation tomorrow afternoon. Um, and one of the things that's also clear, and maybe I shouldn't have picked on the two or three percent who didn't see too much to worry about, um, <laughs> is that uh, automation is also creating jobs. Uh, things are changing, roles are going away, others are going to emerge. There's the famous example, at least famous among people who geek out on future of work questions, of the ATM, uh, which it was believed at one point might be the beginning of the end of retail banking. And it actually led to an increase in employment in retail banking, uh, but of course in somewhat different jobs than before the ATM was invented. So denying that AI or intelligent machines would create opportunities would, uh, would be a lack of imagination, but uh, failing to prepare for the disruption that will happen uh, would be a lack of responsibility on our part. Before we close, we've got a few more questions teed up. The first you can see on the screen for both mayors and business council members in the room is how many of you are involved in some way with your local workforce development board? And this is, as they say, a leading question uh, because um, <laughs> there's a, a strong feeling among the conference that um, finding some way to be involved, if you're not already, if you're not statutorily involved, uh, finding some way to keep up with your workforce board is going to be more important than ever. Um, and that leadership is going to be needed more than ever. The uh, next question is strictly for the mayors in the room. So, uh, and uh, this is uh, an anonymous survey, so you can feel free to be honest. Um, <laughs> yes. Not that we're not known for our honesty already as mayors. Um, but simply, are you familiar or aware of the work that the US Conference of Mayors Workforce Development Council does? And just in case you are not, we're going to tell you. Um, the Workforce Development Council is an affiliate organization. It's under the umbrella of the, of the Conference of Mayors, and its members shape the future of workforce development through dynamic and innovative approaches, solving the needs of both businesses and workers. So you'll find a flyer on your tables with more information about how to have your voice represented on the Workforce Development Council, and we certainly recommend that you do so, because at a moment like this, this body we think has the potential to have a transformative influence on our workforce development in our cities. It is also co-sponsoring the U.S. Conference of Mayors report entitled Technology and the Future Labor Force, which you uh, should also find on your tables. Uh, this report, prepared by IHS Market, is summarizing uh, a lot of cutting-edge research on this topic. And I want to thank Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher, who chairs our Council on Metro Economies <coughs> and the New American Cities, for overseeing the preparation of this report uh, and the conference's Workforce Development Council for co-sponsoring that work. Uh, a final question for this morning for all participants. Um, do you know about and are you familiar with your local Workforce Development Board's strategic plan? Again, anonymous survey. So we just wondered. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds believable. Oh. It's, it's increasing there. Um, certainly strongly encourage uh, that this is the time to uh, get involved with that in a great moment where local leadership is going to make a, a difference. Uh, we believe that residents uh, and the mayors who lead them uh, can create a better future through attention to these issues and through the kind of dynamic problem solving that is instinctive to every mayor. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, a big thank you to our panel once again. Thank you, Robert Mayor Durkin. Thank you to uh, our sponsors for this morning's discussion, McDonald's Corporation and the Conference of Mayors Workforce Development Council for your support. Uh, and with that, we're going to turn it back over to Mayor Benjamin to close us out. Thank you again.
Thank you, Mayor Pete and uh, these fantastic panelists. Uh, before we adjourn, I do want to take a moment to announce the opening of the application process for the 2019 Childhood Obesity Prevention Awards. Um, by now, you, um, cities across the country, know about these awards uh, through the conference's par partnership with the American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America. Uh, since 2012, we've awarded more than $3 million uh, in grants to cities across the country. In fact, our own city in 2017, Columbia, South Carolina, received a grant of $120,000 that we've dedicated to gardening, nutrition, and fitness programs to support our mayor's youth sports initiative uh, to make all these things fun uh, for, for young people. It's been fantastic. In 2019, we're going to award another $445,000 uh, to cities, uh, um, outstanding cities across America, who are rolling out innovative programs to support uh, the fight against childhood obesity in innovative and impactful ways. You can apply online. I want to encourage you to do so at www.usmayors.org forward slash childhood obesity. Um, applications are due on August 1st. Participate, 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 apply, get creative. Let's do this. Um, to showcase the beverage industry's innovation in bringing Americans more choices, smaller portions, and less sugar, the American Beverage Association is going to host a beverage sampling booth uh, tomorrow from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. I did say the American Beverage Association, okay? Uh, so I don't want you guys showing up at the sampling booth looking for other things. Um, uh, Swing by to enjoy a refreshing beverage uh, and, and learn more about the latest initiatives from the ABA uh, and the, our leading American beverage companies. It's going to be, the booth is going to be on the fourth floor out here in, in, the, in the atrium. Um, see you all back here at 1015 for our official opening plenary session. Before the, then, we're going to have from 915 to 945, there'll be a bunch of standing committee meetings, hopefully addressing some of the policy issues that some of you may be individually interested in. Breakfast is adjourned. Thank you all. Attention.